I've been out there with him on the campaign trail at multiple stops. I've seen how hard he is working, how hard First Lady Casey DeSantis is working. I have seen them. They are the real deal. They are honest people. They have gone to all 99 counties in Iowa, the only campaign to do that. That is showing respect to Iowans. That is showing Iowans that they want to hear from you. They want to know what your concerns are. They want to be able to take those concerns and turn them into positive action on your behalf. That's why it is an honor for me to say that I've endorsed Governor Ron DeSantis. He is the right person at the right time to not only lead our country, but to lead the free world. So without further ado, please help me welcome the next president of these United States, Governor Ron DeSantis. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, y'all, for coming. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, please have a seat. Please have a seat. It's exciting to be here. You know, I thought about, because we had a little bit of a, a meeting before, we were talking about some of the, the issues uh, affecting the country, our constitutional rights and all this stuff, and I thought about a uh, discussion, and look, this is a, a story that, uh, that goes back to the founding of our country. We had three of our founding fathers, uh, Benjamin Rush, Thomas Jefferson, and Benjamin Franklin. They had a debate about what was the world's oldest profession. And Benjamin Rush said, uh, Rush was a doctor, so he said the world's oldest profession was a physician because Eve was cut out of Adam's rib. It had to be the physician. Thomas Jefferson, who I think you know designed Monticello and all these other things, said no, the world's oldest profession was the architect because it was the architect that brought order out of all the chaos in the universe. And Benjamin Franklin said, no, that's not right. The world's oldest profession is the politician. Who do you think created the chaos in the first place? And I think about it, it just rings so true today because so much of the problems we see are self-inflicted by an out-of-touch political class. And we can talk about all the different issues, and we've done it throughout the campaign. We'll continue um, everything from crime to border to educate. It's all very important. But one of the things our political class has done is they've really failed to safeguard our Constitution and to protect our constitutional liberties. And this has happened over a number of years. Uh, but we're now in a situation where you used to talk about debates over things like Second Amendment rights about, okay, what might this legislature do or what might Congress do to infringe your rights? And that's still something that's important. Uh, but it's even gone beyond that to where a bureaucracy without anybody ever voting any of these people in can just decide that something like a pistol brace is illegal, and they can render with the stroke of a regulation a million, millions of people to be felons. Just with that, without any debate, without any due process, without any of that, that is a government run amok. That is a bureaucracy that is not in tune with the constitutional design. The, co the, co the Founding Fathers created three branches of government. They did not create a fourth branch of government, an administrative state. And yet we have the administrative state doing this stuff, and it's not just in the realm of Second Amendment, it's in the realm of so many other things. But the fact that they could criminalize something through executive fiat, uh, through a bureaucratic edict, without having any uh, democratic debate, not having your representatives have to vote on that, uh, that is a danger to all constitutional rights, not just the Second Amendment constitutional rights. And so, and truth be told, uh, no one had ever really tried to do that uh, until the Trump administration did it. They really set the ground rule when they tried to do this bump stock thing. Look, it's just a piece of plastic. All of a sudden, people are going to be felons because they have a piece of plastic. So they tried to do it through the bureaucracy. The courts, I think, correctly are, are putting the, 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 the kibosh on that, and I don't think it's constitutional to just simply rule something illegal like that. Uh, but that's what Biden's following. He's following that playbook. So this has been done in two successive administrations. Uh, when I'm president on day one, uh, we are going to reel in this administrative state. We're going to reverse the pistol brace rule. It's going to be gone. We're not going to have to worry about that. So we've come a long way to where well, we should be as Americans, uh, but we need to restore the Constitution to the centerpiece of our national life. If we don't do that, 
than a lot of these other battles. You can win a battle on taxes. You can win a battle on border. You can, and they're important, uh, but ultimately we're not going to save this country uh, unless we get the Constitution back uh, for, first and foremost and these rights respected. And it's not just, yes, the Bill of Rights are important, uh, but it's also the structure of the government. You know, the Founding Fathers didn't even have a Bill of Rights in the original Constitution. Uh, the people that opposed the Constitution were the ones that read it. And the Founders, the reason they said is because, you know, you have a legislative branch, executive, they check and balance each other. That's really the number one protection of freedom. And that is broken down because Congress doesn't do its job. They delegate to the bureaucracy. The bureaucracy does things without. So we need to get all of this back into whack. And if we don't do it now in 2024, I don't know that we're going to be able to have a chance uh, to get it back in whack. So I'll be a president that will do that. I understand, you know, Matt can talk about this, but I remember taking the oath to join the Navy in commission. And you take that oath, and what they ask you to do is not even to defend the country or defend uh, the homeland. Or, it's to support and defend the Constitution. That's your oath that you take and that your, anyone that wears a uniform can risk their lives for. Uh, so we need to do that. I'll be a president that will do that. Uh, we will respect and we will restore the Constitution of the United States of America. And that will be a legacy far beyond two four-year terms in office. It will be a legacy that will last generations. So uh, I got a friend from, uh, who's a U.S. congressman from Kentucky that I'm going to bring out here in a sec. He um, is somebody that is uh, uh, a stickler for the Constitution, and he, does, he takes votes that sometimes he'll be the only one of uh, 435 uh, to vote based on constitutional reasons. And, but that is the type of, of thing that when you're willing to stand alone for what you think is right is something that is admirable. And, and, and the time he did this better than any, uh, any time in his career, and one of the most courageous things I've seen any elected official do was when COVID hit. When yeah. COVID hit, yeah. you had March of 2020, uh, Anthony Fauci uh, assuming control of the government effectively uh, and basically saying that, you know, the world was going to end, you can't leave your house, all this stuff. And so, and basically saying, shut down the country and then have just Congress print $2 trillion and just pay everybody. I don't know what they thought would happen, but that was what they were going to do. But here's the thing. The Congress, the leadership in Congress, they didn't even want to have to vote on printing $2 trillion. They wanted to be able to add $2 trillion to the national debt without even taking a recorded vote. So nobody would have been responsible for this, and they were just going to plan on doing it uh, in the dead of night. Well, uh, uh, Congressman Tom Massey said, no, that's not the way constitutional government works. Uh, we're not going to have this republic die based on unanimous consent where they're hotlining $2 trillion. So he objected to what was going on. He took more flack than probably a congressman has taken, uh, certainly in my lifetime, because of the hysteria. See, we kind of forget, I think, because we're three and a half years past, just how crazy it was at the time. And he was getting hammered and hammered and hammered, and he stood tall. He forced all these congressmen to come back and do their job and actually put their, their names uh, to this piece of legislation. And the thing is, is these congressmen were saying it was too dangerous for them to do their job, but they expected the people at the grocery store to get their groceries and the people at the fast food place to serve them in a drive through and all that. So they wanted everyone else to be doing it. They didn't want to, have to do their job. Uh, so he did it. He stood strong. But he said at the time, if you guys do this, you're going to pay people not to work. You're going to cause problems with the supply chain. You're going to create inflation all and on down the line. And every single thing he warned about ended up happening in the United States of America. So I, I was proud of him for being willing to stand up at the time when very few were able to. Uh, and I'm proud that he's supporting me for president of the United States. And I want you to hear from him right now. So come on out here, buddy. Is it on? Boom, boom, boom. He's being modest. Um, let me tell you the rest of the story, like Paul Harvey says, right? So I got in my car and I drove to Washington. Okay. I drove to Washington, D.C., and I got there. At, uh, I left at midnight from Kentucky, and I got there at 9 a.m., and I stopped everything they were doing. Only one person had to object. 
And I, um, so they called everybody in from around the country, and we're sitting there ready to, to pass this bill, and I've got to watch the microphone and make a motion, and I get a call from 0000000. 000 000 000 000 000. I'm like, who would have a phone number that's, oh, that's Trump. Yeah. <laughs> so I let it go to voicemail. <laughs> so then, like 30 seconds later, I get a call from that same number. I'm like, doesn't he know I'm busy? <laughs> so I let it go to voicemail. Three times it went to voicemail. And I thought, well, you know, he'll leave a message. And so a fourth call, somebody left a message and said, you need to call the president back. So they yielded some time, and I knew they couldn't snap the ball. So I walked out, and I called the, the White House switchboard back. And this voice comes on. I'm coming to you like you've never seen. <laughs> never in your life before have you seen the way in which I will come at you. I'm more popular than you in Kentucky, and you know it. I'm going to back your primary opponent, and you're going to lose. So then I tried to explain, this is constitutional. Like, you can't spend $2 trillion with nobody here. And Mr. President, it's going to pass anyway. So he started screaming at me for like three solid minutes. And the more I tried to speak, the more he screamed. And then he goes, no, this is the second time you've done this. And I was immediately hopeful, because I had done it like eight times, and he forgot. <laughs> on, the fake, on the fake Obamacare repeal, I didn't go along with that. That was fake. They were not going to let you buy affordable insurance. That was a fake repeal. I would not let them do that either. But he had for forgotten about that. But anyways. He repeated it all, and everybody hated me. Nancy Pelosi went on TV, MSNBC, and called me a dangerous nuisance. You know what? I think we need more dangerous nuisances than Nancy Pelosi. So, so I go, so did Trump call me a third-rate grandstander on Twitter? Did anybody remember that? So I walk off the floor. The world's crushing me. Fox News hates me. Drudge Report hates me. Like, everybody was hating me. And the media said, what do you have to say for yourself? Your own president just called you a third-rate grandstander. And I said, I was very, very mortified by that and offended. I said, I'm at least second-rate. So anyways... But when everybody was hating me, I got a call from Florida. And I'm like, I think it was Daytona Beach, whatever your, your number comes up. And because uh, I got a new phone and I actually lost his number. I didn't tell you this. But I'm like, well, I, maybe, maybe that's Ron. So I take it and it's, and it's Ron DeSantis. And he said, you know what? You're taking a lot of flack. He said, and I know the polling on this. Remember, there were $1,200 checks for everybody. That was the cheese in the trap, okay? $1,200 was the cheese in the trap. And, but that bill was 80% popular with Republicans. And I was the only one who would oppose it. And this is the only guy who called me to offer support. And he said, you know what? It's wrong. And we, we can't shut our governments down. We can't shut our economies down. We can't deny our kids an education. He said, I know the polling is against me in Florida. He said, but I am going to do the right thing because in two years, people will know it was the right thing. And I said, man, I hope this guy runs for president someday. <laughs> By the way, I, I built this. Um, it's a debt badge that I wear on my lapel. I'm an engineer, too. I'll pass it around. Somebody, somebody make sure I get that back. But it's, it's to shame my colleagues. When they look at me, they have to see the debt updating in real time. Every second of every day. I love getting on an elevator with Adam Schiff. <laughs> one, of, one, of the, one of the Congress women, she was staring at my chest. I said, my eyes are up here. <laughs> like, they can't look away from the debt when I'm wearing it. And um, I've been saving, by the way, this guy is the Energizer Bunny, Ron DeSantis. I cannot keep up with him. I'm worn out. I, I drove 700 miles yesterday to get here because you guys matter, right? By the time this election gets to Kentucky, it will be decided, and you're going to decide which direction it goes. And that's why I came here. I can barely keep up with this guy. We've been on planes, trains, and automobiles today. I'm not exaggerating. His kids were excited. <laughs> How? Is it a train? Is it a plane? What is it, Dad? 
But um, I brought him another. I brought another deck clock that I built for him to have, so he can keep track of the mess we're making in DC. All right. All right, this is this will be, and I know it's a town hall, and we've got to quit speaking, so I'll sit down and, and, and let you guys drive the discussion. This will be the most pro Second Amendment president we have had in a hundred years, bar none. So please get him elected. Thank you, thank you. All right, we'll take some questions. Anyone got anything? I have a that question because I know you're talking about. Yeah. Like a lot of things that were passed and that like that was a huge aspect of the inflation that we're dealing with. No, as an economist, somebody who studied it and actually took it at, at a college level, like a lot of the things that they were doing is actually the huge reason we had inflation mm -hmm. even before Biden got in. Now. I, and I also think it was like the worst possible plan that we could have done. What can we do? So, with you currently in office and going into if, if tomorrow to become president, what's the game plan? Because there's a lot of people here that can't make it, like at all. Like, even as Senator Rick Scott from Florida said, it's $750 extra a month for people in Florida. That's 90% of an SSI beneficiary's income. They're dying in, 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 in ditches and abandoned buildings. What can we do to end And the Fed. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, the, the Fed did enable this, and here's what we did. It, it's worse than borrowing money. They created $5 trillion out of thin air um, under Trump's budget director, Russ Vogt. And I give him grief for this. I call, I call some strikes and, and balls here, okay? You know, a lot of a lot of this is due to Joe Biden, but how have you added up how much was under Trump? It was like seven point eight trillion in four years. Seven that's a record for anybody, Democrat or Republican, and a lot of it was created out of thin air. We can't undo it. The only way you could undo it is to tax that money, bring it back in and burn five trillion dollars and take it back out of circulation. And that would kill the economy, too. We are stuck. Those prices you see, they are baked in. But to keep them from going up more, we got to cut spending. That's the only monetary thing we can do. But. Well, and, you know, we, I used to, we, we worked together on, like, auditing the Fed and stuff like that. Because what the Fed has done is they've taken so much power uh, over the economy when they're, you know, the role of a central bank should just be stable currency. And you should not be doing – I mean, they've done – they started the quantitative easing for the financial crisis. That was supposed to be extraordinary measures, and they just kept doing it for so long. And then when COVID hit, the Congress did the $2 trillion with the CARES Act, and then they really, really created a lot of money and pumped it in. And then they said, you're not going to have inflation. When you do this, you don't get inflation immediately. It's like 18 to 20, 22 months later. That's when – and that's exactly what happened. And yes, Biden came in and poured gas on the fire. It was totally reckless, and he shouldn't have done it. But but it was already baked in the cake for what they did in 2020. Because remember, they did another 2.2 trillion in December of 2020, which basically handed off that money to Biden when he came in, and he used that to do DEI and a bunch of nonsense that we're still living with to this day. Uh, but it was very predictable that that would happen. He said that back in March of 2020. Uh, and yet the Congress just kept printing and printing and, sp and spending and spending for, for the calendar year, March of 2020 to March of t 2021. I think it was like $6.2 trillion uh, that was spent uh, during that period. And we've never, that's more than like World War II uh, that, that we did. And for what? What did this country gain by that? We should have never handed the country over to Fauci in the first place. That is where we went wrong by doing that. But I do think, um, you know, so I agree, spending, all that stuff. And I, and I think, look, he's willing to cut spending. There are other Republicans that are. There are not enough who are willing to, so we're going to need presidential leadership to force them. But ultimately, we're kind of set up for failure in the sense that even if we did do a good job with the budget, new people get elected in the future. A lot of times they undo it, right? So you really need things like... Uh, term limits for members of Congress, balanced budget amendment for the Constitution, line item veto for the president. Well, I really think that those would be uh, really good positive reforms. But the other thing you could do to reduce inflation is to just reverse the Green New Deal and open up the energy for production, the oil and the gas. We have more of that than anywhere. 
Uh, it could be good for national security, drive down prices. Um, you know, you are seeing gas prices have gone down. I think a lot of that is because of uh, overall economic weakness. I don't think it's because obviously Biden is trying to restrict. Um, but it will go back up unless we unless we open up. So so that I would do that on day one, open that all up, federal lands, all this stuff. Uh, that would be good for consumers, but it would help drive prices in a better spot because the energy affects everything that's produced in this country. That, that reminds me of a phone call, another phone call I got from Governor Ron DeSantis. He said Fauci and Burks are going around and using the imprimatur of the federal government. They're talking to state uh, health officials and getting them to shut down the, the government. It's like scaring them into this. He said, I have banned Fauci and Burks from Florida. <laughs> and I'm like, Wait, can you do that? Wait, but what he meant is you can't ban them from going to the beaches, but you can ban them from talking to state employees, right? Yeah, so I mean, the thing was, is they were doing all kinds of nonsense. Um, and it was the, the, the kids in school, oh, that was bad. Uh, you know, Florida, especially like the summer of 2020, when we kind of had our first COVID wave, they were like, you've got, because at that time, people thought, when it went up, you had to shut down so that it would stop. And I knew these things had a natural cycle because I looked at other parts of the world. So I'm like, we are not doing that. No way. That was, I was probably getting hammered more at that point than ever, you know, since I've been in elected office. Um, but then, which, and then we ended up right. Literally, Fauci said, close. And like two days later, it was clear that Florida had peaked in terms of the thing. So like to, to close after it already peaked would have been suicidal. So he was wrong about that. But what really honked me off was that they were, they were trying to get universities to police the students and not let them interact and stuff. And the thing is, these kids were at such low risk uh, from this. So I put the edict out to our universities. I said, do not restrict their social lives. Let them go and be, be college students. Because what was happening in like new, the Northeast, they were isolating these college kids. That was leading to depression and anxiety and, and, and suicides went up and drug abuse. It was such ridiculous tunnel vision. And so you know what happened in Florida? Kids got to go. Yeah, you were uh, driving in Tallahassee, Florida State campus in, in September of 2020. Uh, you'd see them all out at the bars or at house parties or whatever. Did, did a lot of them get COVID? Yeah, you know what happened? They got it, they got over it, and then it left the campus, basically. And so that was the, the, what, what we knew would happen. So, but the, the way that they came down on young people uh, was really catastrophic. K-12 school closures, like in California. You know, I'm, it's, you, know, you know we did it right in Florida because when I'm debating Gavin Newsom a couple weeks ago, the governor of California, he was trying to say California was open and Florida was not dirty. Are you kidding me? They had kids locked out of school for a year, year and a half. I had families moving from California to Florida just so their kids could play sports their senior year or participate in activities. So, but, but the damage they did to K-12 students and college students uh, with these edicts was just unbelievable. And so... Uh, I, I was, you know, a lot of Republicans aren't that popular on college campuses. I can tell you those students appreciated uh, me for saving their college experience. They got to live like normal human beings. The, the, the governor mentioned one of the piece of legislation, the Green New Deal. Uh, most of the bills we pass are like 1,000, 2,000, 6,000 pages. When I discovered the Green New Deal was 14 pages, I decided to read it. <laughs> it, took, it took five minutes to read the Green New Deal. When I got done, I realized why it's 14 pages. There's only 64 crayons in the big box. <laughs> when this first came up, I guess last year, earlier this year, 
we had the, um, uh, I had the Florida legislature pass uh, a law. So in Florida, uh, we do not recognize the WHO lockdown treaty at all. So it's, it has, it's null and void in Florida. But, uh, when, when uh, January 20th, 2025, when I take office, uh, that will be a very easy uh, decision for me to just take that lockdown treaty, rip it up, and throw it in the trash can. It will be dead in, in the United States. Uh, once I become president. And, uh, and that goes for all this stuff uh, coming out of uh, places like the World Economic Forum. We've done things in Florida like kneecap ESG. Uh, we banned the imposition of a central bank digital currency, which is what they want to do. And honestly, it will affect Second Amendment rights, really, because what they want to do with central bank digital currency, they want to eliminate crypto, they want to eliminate cash, and then force all financial transactions to go through this digital dollar that is controlled, uh, basically, by the Federal Reserve. Uh, you will lose financial privacy on that, and what they will do is they will impose restrictions on what you can purchase. So for example, ammunition, they may not like that you purchase something, they may stop you. A gasoline, you may be doing more than they want. So, that, so they will impose basically a social credit score uh, system. They will impose uh, ways to force your behavior. And when I started raising uh, the alarm about this, it was interesting because, you know, I, the people at the World Economic Forum have admitted this is what they want to do. This is not like, but it was interesting. So I started talking about, uh, and I use the analogy, sometimes government will do things and they're, they're trying to be benevolent on the surface, but it's really a wolf in sheep's clothing. And that happens a lot. This is a wolf coming as a wolf. Like, if you don't recognize the threat to your freedom based on having something like this, um, then you just haven't been alive the last three or four years with what these elites have done. You know, you remember the truckers in Canada they started shutting down their transactions. The government did it. They didn't have no right to do that. So, so I started raising the alarm, and like it was like every media outlet, like uh, New York Times, Washington Post, all these said, DeSantis is peddling conspiracy theories about the central bank. And they were all doing this. And I'm like, okay, why would they all? Because this is something that they want to do. And they realize it would be a massive amount of power a transfer of power from we the people to people that are elites in government. Uh, so we will, on day one as president, also nix this idea of a central bank digital currency. Uh, that is not going to happen.
Thomas uh, uh, take, but um, one is I want Congress to uh, assume more responsibility. I want less power from the executive branch. And so they have a piece of legislation called the RAINS Act, which is any major regulation will not go into effect unless it's approved by both houses of Congress. So this serves two good functions. One, if a bureaucracy is running amok, your elected representatives can stop that. The other thing is, if there's something that's done that's not good and your representatives vote for it, you can hold them accountable for voting and vote them out of office. And, and I welcome that, even though that would mean less power uh, for me. But no, on all these agencies, you put people in, like for example, Biden uh, did the, you know, he wants to force the electric vehicles. I, he's doing that through the bureaucracy. I'll reverse it through the bureaucracy. And so, you know, that's, that's we'll definitely do that. Uh, we will rein in 100%. I think the, the challenge is, is doing things in ways that are going to stick beyond just your term in office. And I think you need two terms to be able to really make it stick. But we're going to do things like take, uh, there's 50,000 bureaucrats who are involved in policy making. We're taking them out of civil service, putting them in a separate Schedule F, and they can be terminated at will at that point. Uh, we're going to take, take agencies and parcel them out around the country. They should not all be accumulating power in D.C. What's happened is you have all this bureaucratic class in D.C., and they now function as a separate uh, class of society that's separate and distinct from the American people. Uh, having, and I look, I look at something like the FBI and what's happened to that agency. If the FBI had been headquartered in Biloxi, Mississippi, I do not think you would have seen the culture develop uh, the way it's been. I think it's been because it's been enmeshed in the D.C. politics and D.C. and Virginia. Uh, that and, and the personnel they've got, all this stuff has created this problem over, over many, many years. Uh, so that's something else we're going to do. Um, and then we also have a bunch of other levers uh, that we're going to pull where you're going to have a president asserting Article II power to the fullest extent to basically corral power that has gotten outside what the Constitution envisioned. And yes, I'm going to get sued on it. I, 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 everything I do, uh, we will get sued on. We know, that's what happens in Florida. Every single thing I do, they sue. And they find out, they try to find a liberal judge. A lot of times they'll rule against us, and we went on appeal. That's, what, that's usually what happens. But like the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court, I think they'll back us on this. Because it's like you can vote somebody in as president, and the bureaucrats just laugh at that. They just do what they want anyways. That is not constitutional government, and that will end when we're president. Yeah. I think this is the first presidential candidate who has ever come out in favor of legislation that would limit his power as a president. I mean, that was, you know, like, But, you know, on, on the way over here, he was telling me about stuff he did in Florida, and I said, did you do that by executive order, or did you have to pass that through the legislature? And the answer was always, I got it passed through the legislature. And that's, I mean, that's the hard work. That's the hard way of doing it. But it sticks. The, everything that you've done that you put through the legislature will be in place after you're gone. And that's what we need. He mentioned the RAINS Act. That actually, we debated that and, and had a hearing on that in my subcommittee, the Judiciary Subcommittee. Jim Jordan wanted me to chair the subcommittee on antitrust. And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of a complicated law. And isn't that the government going in and punishing, you know, winners and losers or pick, picking the winners and losers? He says, I'll rename it to the uh, committee, the subcommittee on administrative law regulatory reform and antitrust. <laughs> And I said, administrative law? That's like 95% of the government? You're going to give me jurisdiction over that? So I took it. And, and he's like, yeah, man, so you can have hearings on raw milk or whatever you want. So, so I've been doing that. I had, I've had a hearing on the fact that four meat processors control 85% of the U.S. market. And I've got a bill to fix that to empower, not by going in and busting them up and having the government sit there with guards and say, are you colluding? But by giving small processors and farmers and consumers the power to get the USDA the hell out of their lives. And another thing, 
everything we'll do that is kind of like because the administrative state has been uncountable. You know, you have like the Department of Education has like SWAT teams and stuff. We are going to eliminate that nonsense. I mean, they should not be militarized. They're politically weaponized, and now they're 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 militarized. Like that is totally unacceptable. So you're going to see these IRS agents, Department of Education, like that is just a, a non-starter with them. They should not be wielding that. Power. Century. 
We've had three major uh, events, I think, in, in America above all else. 9-11 and the wars that followed, the financial crisis and the Great Recession, and then COVID. And of all three of those, COVID had the widest impact across the country because, you know, some people got COVID. Obviously, people got sick. Obviously, there were deaths, which is a huge thing. But then even people that never got it or never knew they had it, they were restricted or they were implicated some ways in many of these places around the country. Uh, so we've got to have a reckoning. I'm going to bring the reckoning, and uh, this country's going to be better off for that reckoning. <laughs> Yeah, but you know, it's interesting. Iowa's got a pretty good Navy tradition. As we, in fact, we were just talking about it uh, coming up, you know. Yeah, so it's, so, so it's interesting. And, uh, you know, one of the guys as a former baseball player, you know, Bob Feller was in the Navy in, in World War II. And so he could have just been traveling and pitching and entertaining troops. But he's like, no, I want to I wanna go to war. Go ahead. Can you switch to Iowa by January 15th? Is that legal? I will be voting in the Florida primary. I mean, definitely. But we've been here about three years, and I know personally what affects me is the growing trend of insurance being canceled in Florida and California and Louisiana and all these places. And being a military family that has multiple homes in multiple states, that worries me. What can the government do? Yeah, I mean, I think, there, I think there's a couple things. I mean, one, because of the inflation and everything with COVID, like it's been a problem nationwide just generally. Two, I think you have a lot of movement to things like ESG and in climate change and stuff, which is causing these policies to be more expensive, which I don't think is, is a legitimate way to do it. Um, you know, we've kneecapped ESG a lot in Florida, mostly with our pensions, but I do think it's getting into that industry. Um, and then, you know, just in Florida, obviously, we have storms and stuff. We've actually done some reforms, and we've had uh, we've had six companies come back in, and we got another another five in the hopper. So to have eleven in a year come in, you know, that's different. You know, I think because they had been they've been leaving California or whatever. When we saw the problem, we did stuff to do. But I think I, I'm concerned about this ESG. I'm concerned about them trying to say climate change and everything because that's going to make some of these things very very expensive if they're pricing in all these things. That, that, that very well may not happen. Uh, and that's new from where we were 20 or 30 years ago. Yep. I want to have a question. Um, so I've heard rumors that, and it's probably not rumors, that Biden wants to pass the red flag law. And I understand the premise behind it. I also understand it can be used as revenge. And my biggest concern is military veterans that have claimed PTSD, which is a very real thing. I know I'm married to a veteran, and I know several veterans. That red flag law would make them criminals and not able to own guns. What can be done about that? I mean, besides not passing it, these veterans don't deserve that. Just because they have PTSD doesn't mean they can't own a gun. They're not going to go out and shoot people. Well, right. I know. I, and I don't think post-traumatic stress should be a disqualifier um, uh, at all. But, you know, here's the thing. We, um, you know, and, and I think I think Matt mentioned it, but, but you, know, you know, it was Donald Trump that said his policy on guns was that he wanted to take the guns first, go through due process later. Uh, that is not constitutional to do that, okay? And here's the thing, it's not even necessarily about uh, a Second Amendment. Obviously, it implicates that. But the government can't come and take your TV set without due process. Government can't come... Uh, and take your refrigerator from you without you. That's the whole idea that you have the right to life, liberty, and property that can't be deprived unless they give you due process. Uh, and that's what you have to have. So I don't understand why you would want to say that, that somehow due process doesn't matter. Um, and I do worry about uh, how that would be utilized because we have a government that is weaponized agencies uh, and, and if you're in like a blue jurisdiction, 
Uh, Katie barred the door. Uh, why would you want to give the government any more power uh, over your freedoms? I think they absolutely would abuse that. I don't think there's any question about that. And I think it'd go far beyond veterans. Uh, I think that there are, you know, because we, we, we sit here and talk about, like, you know, legal system, but, but we've, got, we've got some serious problems with how this system's been perverted. Uh, and you look in some of these areas, uh, I don't know that you get adequate due process. Uh, elected judges, uh, very left-wing areas. So, so I think it would be a, a huge, huge risk to a lot of people just on the weaponization angle. Yeah, it's, and there's something going on right now that a whistleblower told me about. And I've tried to introduce legislation to fix it, but it's pushing a string uphill until we get somebody like Governor Ron DeSantis. Here's the problem. Some veterans, let's say they're 50% disabled and they apply for 90% disability. That involves an interview and a, and a doctor uh, asking questions. And one question they ask is, do you manage your own finances? And if you say you do not manage your own finances, they, have, they now decide that you are not qualified to own a gun, have one in the house, or ammunition in the house. And the way they impose this is they send you a letter, they approve your 90% disability, which for some people may mean they're not homeless, right? They get to make their rent payment. With, so they, they get an envelope in the mail that's got two things in it. Number one, we've approved your disability. Number two, sign, sign away your rights, acknowledging that you're subject to the Brady Law here. And so that's how they pressure veterans who are disabled into giving up their rights to own a gun. And the only the only litmus test they're using is if you answer that question wrong, you may it might be that your wife you know controls the 401k or the stock so that you own, and you just if you answer honestly, they take your guns away. This is this is sad. They were going to do it at the Social Security Administration, and they had already promulgated this rule, but it was in Obama's last six months in office, so we were able to undo it through the Congressional Review Act when he lost his reelection. But we, we are not able to do it with this VA issue. And that's, these are the things, like, Ron has been in Congress six years before he was governor. I've been in there 11 years now. We, we know where the problems are. We just can't find a president who will do anything about them. And, but we got one here. Dependent on them and intertwined with them, and, and we'll do that. 
but you also have to deal with what they're doing here in the United States. So we'll have a strong posture in terms of being proud of, of, of America. Uh, I think we stand for really important uh, principles and, and values, and I think ultimately, uh, whatever anyone else is selling around the world, uh, you don't see people trying to break through the Great Wall of China to get into China. I can tell you that. You see a lot of people doing whatever they can to get into this country. Yeah, we shouldn't allow, allow them to come in illegally like we are uh, at all. Uh, but the fact that for all that the left does to complain about this country, you know, I don't see them moving to Russia or China or Iran. Uh, they're not doing that. And, and so we still, in spite of all our problems and all that, you know, you know we, we get more right uh, because of, we have a great Declaration of Independence and a great Constitution. So let's, let's revive those things and let's turn this country around. That's all we got to do. So obviously, federal government, you know, we're not going to allow infringements, particularly through the bureaucracy. We'll have a Republican Congress. I don't think you have to worry about uh, them passing legislation to infringe. But you have this situation where California, I mean, you know, we did this debate. They put on the thing, the, 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 the shooting differences, and California had more than 40, even though they have all these... Um, all these re really restrictive and onerous laws that, that violate people's rights. And the governor out there said he wants to re get rid of the Second Amendment as his position. Uh, so how do you do that? Yeah, you're not doing harm and you're protecting you from the federal government, but the state governments are doing that. Uh, one thing is, uh, I think, the type of judges that you're appointing on the courts. And we've had judges who... Uh, maybe more conservative on a lot of things. We just have not wanted to really deal with fi with firearms cases for whatever reason. Uh, it's almost like it's they, they view it as kind of like a second class citizen in the Bill of Rights almost. That they're willing to do anything on First Amendment. They're willing to do others, but they just don't really want to deal with that that kind of Second Amendment. So we're going to have judges that are going to uh, say that the Second Amendment says what it means and means what it says, and it should be applied uh, based on the original understanding. And that should be done in ways that uh, vindicate people's rights when they're threatened. So I'll be in a good position to do that. It's interesting, uh, on the Supreme Court, you know, you look at uh, the, how the court is now, people say it's a 6-3 conservative court. That's not really true. Uh, you have three liberal judges who will always be in lockstep on any high-profile case. You don't even have to worry. You just put them down. Then you've got two... Uh, constitutional conservatives, Thomas and Alito, who get it right almost every time. Uh, but then the other four uh, really vary. You, know, you have Chief Justice Roberts, who, you know, sometimes there, sometimes there. Uh, then you've had both all Gorsuch, Barrett, and Kavanaugh, the three Trump judges, who, um, you know, have ruled well uh, most of the time, but, but have also not ruled great on, on some cases. And so, the next president, certainly if you survey eight years, would likely have to replace Thomas and Alito. And so when you're doing that, if you replace them with, with the justices similar to what Trump appointed, that actually moves the court to the left yep. uh, because they've set the standard. So I'm in a position, having kind of understanding these issues, I'll be able to, appoint, first of all, you're never going to find someone as good as, 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 as CT. That's just not going to happen. But somebody in that mold... Uh, who understands uh, the original understanding of the Constitution and is willing to rule correctly when the media doesn't like it, the left doesn't like it, and all along down the line. And so, so Will, you can count on me to do that. I think you may be able to appoint it four over, over eight years and really leave a legacy of a court for, for 25 years. Because if, if, we, if we don't win the election uh, and the Dems come in, they're going to be able to undo the progress on the court probably in the next four years. Uh, and that will be a liberal majority that will run roughshod over this country. Here's the thing. We used to complain about some of these liberal judges, like, like, like Ruth Bader Ginsburg or whatever. The people that are coming out of these law schools now are much, much more ideological and, and extreme than, than what was being produced 50 years ago. And so that's where the left's going to look. Uh, and it will be a massive transfer of power from the American people uh, to five 
likely just five liberal unelected judges. So I know that in 2016, the court was front and center for a lot of conservatives because of the death of Justice Scalia. We knew that there was going to be an appointment that needed to be made, and that certainly was a big motivator for me. And I remember at the time, you know, there's a lot of conservatives that, that did not necessarily want to vote for Trump. And my argument was, look, do you want Hillary to, to replace Scalia, or do you want Trump to do? He has a list. He says he's going to pick from it. And so, so that caused a lot of conservatives to go out and vote when they maybe weren't as hot on doing it. But I think the court in this election is going to be huge. I think it goes to the rights that in the states to make sure that the federal constitution is enforced, and it's going to have so many more implications on and on down the line. So I will get those, those appointments right for you. You're not going to have to worry about me putting somebody on who then disappoints us like we've seen uh, throughout uh, history. Well, listen, uh, we're out of time. I want to thank everyone for coming. Uh, I know many of you have signed up for this election. I thank you for that. If you haven't, I hope you'll sign up to submit your caucus for us before you leave today. And I hope everybody is willing to go work your friends, family, your neighbors, your coworkers to bring out more support for us on January 15th. You decide who the next president is going to be. The media doesn't get to decide. Uh, the pundits don't get to decide. You here and I will get to decide, and with me, you have somebody uh, that is earning it, that is showing up, answering questions, uh, doing what it takes, because that is what you deserve, somebody that shows up, listens to you, uh, and will take all that great wisdom up to Washington so we can drain this swamp once and for all. Thank you all. God bless.